So you want to be a middle school counselor. Well, in this video, I'm going to share 10 things that you need to know about what it's like being a middle school counselor. In order to work with this group of kids, you have to have thick skin, like a rhinoceros or an elephant. And you're probably wondering, what does that mean? Well, I will say this, middle schoolers speak their mind. And sometimes they'll say things to you that'll cut you deep to your core like a knife. For example, let's say that you just got a new haircut or a new hairstyle or even a new outfit. And you look in the mirror and you think you look good today. And you go to school and students will say something about your outfit or your hair and it'll throw you off guard. And you have to have thick skin. You can't let them get under your skin and show them that they're bothering you. And that's hard sometimes. Sometimes it's funny and they don't mean anything and you have to let it roll off your back. There was one day that I wore this pink sweater and some khaki pants and I was walking in the cafeteria, this boy stopped me and he said, you look like ice cream, Mr. Burnett, like some strawberry ice cream. I had to stop for a minute and I kind of laughed to myself, but literally they will say just about anything. And there are some times when they will ask you some inappropriate questions or very personal things and you have to be able to respond in a way that is respectful and show that you are not getting offended even if they do hurt your feelings. You have to remember that they are children and unfortunately we live in a world where there's not the same boundaries and respect for adults that there used to be and sometimes students will say the most hurtful things and sometimes they're just dealing with their own stuff and they're projecting it on you and you're the closest person to them. You can't go off on them, you can't call them names, you can't say hurtful things about them you have to be professional and sometimes it means that you just have to walk away. So I always say don't take things personally. You can correct students professionally in a way that doesn't damage their relationship and I do it all the time, especially if they ask me deeply personal questions. I always tell them in a joking way, hey, I don't have any friends under the age of 18 so the question you just asked me, I'm not gonna answer it. And then they back off most times. Working with middle school, you have to know that all three grade levels have different personality styles and characteristics. So let's start with sixth grade. Sixth graders coming in, they're very baby-like. They're still in the elementary stage where they're following all the rules. They're very good in the beginning. They're kind of timid and, and lost and confused and scared. And that doesn't last. Trust me, by December, they've changed just a little bit where they're getting a little bit more comfortable. But in the beginning, they are still in a very elementary stage. And I love working with sixth graders. In the beginning, they come across as very innocent and they will try their best. And sometimes they change just a little bit towards the end of the school year. But for the most part, sixth grade is an awesome grade to begin with. They do have a lot of social issues and I'm gonna talk about that more in another one of the tips in this video. I don't know what happens to sixth graders that summer before they come back to school and start as seventh graders, but they change. They're growing, their personalities change because some of them are hitting that puberty stage and you may have the sweetest child in sixth grade and then when they come back in seventh grade, they're a completely different child. Just be prepared. I always say that seventh grade year is like the middle child syndrome year. So you know how that awkward phase, that's when they're going through all those growth changes. A lot of things are happening with their bodies and their minds and with their friendships and their adult relationships. There's a lot going on with them. And so they may be completely different. Just be on the lookout for that. And then you have your eighth graders. By eighth grade, most time your students are settled in. They are the top dogs of the school. They're your, they can be your leaders that point they pretty much know the expectations they're on autopilot and they're just kind of waiting and coasting until they get to ninth grade and they can start all over again but by eighth grade they think they know it all for the most part now I'm going to talk a little bit about what a typical day looks like for a middle school counselor from my perspective I start my morning early I get to work about eight o'clock I sit down in my office and create a to-do list based on the things that I need to get accomplished for that day so I check my emails I listen to my voicemail make sure that I don't have to connect with anybody I make a list of students that I need to connect with and check in with at that day. After I've created my to-do list, and then I start making my rounds and checking in on students. Sometimes you can plan out your entire day as a school counselor, create your to-do list, and then a student crisis occurs and kind of derails your whole day. And that's normal. You just have to be able to adjust and roll with the flow. You gotta be flexible like Stretch Armstrong or Mr. Fantastic for my Marvel fans. Now let's talk a little bit about duty. So this is the dreaded word that most people don't like to hear about, but most times in school counselor roles, you're gonna have duty spots. I have morning arrival duty, I have lunch duty, and I have dismissal duty. And that sounds like a lot, but these are perfect opportunities for you to connect with students, build relationships, check in on them. So let's say you have a student who's always joyful and jolly and, and having fun with their friends and laughing and joking, and one day you see them off on their own or they're withdrawn. 
This is the perfect opportunity for you to observe and build connections with those students and know their personalities enough to know if something's wrong so that way you can strategically check in on them. You can also build connections and strengthen relationships with students by simply asking them questions. So you can go in and don't ask them the typical like, how is your day? Ask them random questions like, if you could go on vacation, what would your dream vacation be? Start asking them follow-up questions later on. This helps you learn your students. It helps them get familiar with you and build a connection with you. Duty spots are also a good time for you to start observing students so that you can get a feel of their personalities. You can see who their friends are. You can get a sense of their personality and their style and their humor. And you can just get to know them overall. This is also time for you to be personable with them. You can make appropriate jokes with them and find out about their likes and dislikes and get a sense of who they are as a person. Going to duty is also a time where those students will get familiar with you and so that when they do have issues, they even feel comfortable coming to talk with you because you're building connections with them. When I visit classrooms in the morning, sometimes students will stop me and say, hey, Mr. Burnett, I need to see you later on. Is that okay? And so me visiting classrooms greeting them by name and making myself visible and available to them is the perfect way for me to build relationships with my students but also let them know that i'm available to help them when they need me some of the other things that you may experience during a typical day you may have parent meetings so like parent conferences where people will just show up and say i need to speak with the counselor if you're available you may have 504 meetings iep meetings uh, student support meetings. These are what a typical day can look like for a school counselor. So I do a lot of individual counseling sessions where students come in and whether they're self-referral, they just drop by my office and say that they need to see me if I'm available and I stop what I'm doing and I can talk to them and meet with them. Now let's talk about some of the student issues that you may encounter as a school counselor in middle school. Be prepared to deal with lots of conflict. So he's looking at me or she's looking at me she's rolling her eyes at me she stuck her tongue out at me he's talking about me or he pushed me he said something about me on social media you're going to have to do a lot of peer mediation conflict resolution so a great idea for you to gather resources on conflict resolution be able to talk about I statements, how to uh, resolve conflict respectfully, and even be able to complete restorative circles. If you've never done a restorative circle with students, they are amazing and they are extremely effective, but it takes skill, knowledge, and practice to be comfortable with them. And if you need help, I have a video on restorative circles. You can watch that after you watch this one. The link will be in the description below. This year, I also did a lot of academic advising. I'm not really sure what happened and maybe you're experiencing this on your campus this year, but I had a lot of students who failed or went to summer school and it wasn't because they weren't doing the work, they were. But a lot of times they weren't turning in the work and I don't understand why that happened. They would do the work, they would do the homework, they would do the assignments, but either they would lose them or they simply were not turning them in. My students really struggled this year. I'm not really sure what happened, but we would have individual counseling sessions where I would talk about goal setting, organization, study tips, and different things to help them be academically successful. But I did a lot of academic advising. And keep in mind, again, I had sixth grade this year, so that's a huge adjustment going from fifth grade to sixth grade, where in fifth grade, most times they have one or two teachers, and when they transition to sixth grade, they have to go to different classes. They have six or more teachers with different personality styles and different ways of doing things as far as procedures, systems, and routines, and it can be an overall culture shock, especially if you have students who are in advanced classes on top of all those other responsibilities. So it's a lot. And I did a lot of work with my students on transitions. And I had a lot of conversations with families about adjustments in sixth grade too. You also need to become familiar with your district and your school's uh, crisis response team. Like if you have students with um, ideation or self-harm. This is another thing that in middle school is a very prevalent issue. So this is another thing that you need to be able to support students with as far as crisis management. You need to know the protocols for how to respond to students when they are in crisis, what that looks like, who to reach out to for support, how to document things, and how to follow up with families on what to do and how to refer them to outside agencies or community partners for support. So that leads me to the next topic of getting to know your teachers. Depending on how your student caseload is set up, 
sometimes you can work in a school where you have a specific grade level, like sixth grade one year, seventh grade the next year, eighth grade another. Or you may even work with a caseload of students that are split by alphabetical last name. I've seen this in some middle schools too. But either way, you gotta become familiar with your teachers. Know who they are, be able to uh, collaborate with them and consult with them. One way to build positive relationships with your teachers is keeping them in the loop. And if you can, I would highly suggest that you meet with them at least once a month for a grade level meeting. Basically, just you set an agenda, be able to talk about specific topics, ask them what areas they need support in, be able to connect them with resources, and just be a listening ear. And if you can't meet with all your grade level team once a month, I would highly suggest that you either join PLC meetings and talk to them during their content groups, like talking to all ELA teachers on the time that they meet, or your math team when they meet. And that may be a little bit more time consuming, but either way, you have to make time to build connections with your teachers. You gotta get their support, you gotta get their insight, you gotta be able to bridge the gap and be able to connect them with resources and become familiar with them. You're a team, you gotta be able to work with them. And they will be more likely to support your school counseling program if you communicate, collaborate, and consult with them. Make sure that you come up with a great system for student referrals if they need to see you. This could look like a number of different things and it depends on your campus. For me, I build up my caseload and my referral system by again, being visible in the morning, visiting every single classroom and students will self-refer based on when they see me in the hallway. They'll talk to me and say, hey, Mr. Burnett, I need to talk to you about something later on. Also, check with your teachers and come up with a system so that they can send students to you. That could look like them calling you and saying, hey, are you available? Sending you a quick email and asking you, can you check in with a student? Also create a QR code where you set up a student self-referral survey on Microsoft Forms or Google Forms. If students are allowed to use their cell phones on campus or you work at a school where students have their own access to a personal computer or a Chromebook. You can set up a very simple referral where you ask the students to submit their name, their grade level, the date, and a brief description of why they need to see the counselor. And then you can set your schedule based on that and pull students when you're available to talk to them. Keep in mind as a middle school counselor, no two days are gonna be the same. You may have a long list of students you need to check in with. And sometimes you have to balance that with the other duties that you have to do and the other district mandated things that you have to do. A lot of times you may even be running around putting out constant fires. So you may be called to deal with a crisis for the student or um, if a student is having a meltdown or a panic attack or things like that. You can create your schedule, you can make your to-do list, but just keep in mind you gotta be flexible. You can even set up a mailbox outside of your counseling office for paper referrals. And on that paper referral, you can put the same information you put on the uh, electronic one, such as the name, the date, and ask the student to briefly describe what they need to see you or talk to you about. You can even do this with check boxes, so you don't have to have them do open-ended responses. Our counseling secretary will ask students to fill out the request to see the counselor on our iPad, and that's basically just a Microsoft form that they fill out. This is also good for documentation purposes at the end of the school year so that you can keep track of how many students come to see you. Now let's talk about forms of student support. So of course you're gonna do individual counseling sessions. I've mentioned that throughout this video. You're also gonna do small groups. I haven't really talked much about that. In middle school, you will be able to do small groups based on your availability and your school schedule. But again, I wouldn't suggest doing those right off the bat. I usually organize my small groups around October or November, right before Christmas break. Typically, middle school counselors do not teach classroom counseling lessons. You may be in a school where you may have to teach those lessons. It really honestly just depends. But every middle school that I've worked in, I, as the counselor, create the lessons and the teachers are the ones who facilitate them. So I'll create the SEL character develop lessons. I'll share them out with the teachers and on set days, those teachers will share them out with the students. So they would be the one who teach the students the character uh, lessons or the PowerPoints that I create. And that has its pros and cons. The pros is it allows you the flexibility to do other things that support students, such as those individual counseling sessions, small groups, or all those other things that you have to do. But the cons, sometimes that they won't facilitate those lessons with fidelity and actually teach them like they care. And sometimes they just won't do them at all. So it really just depends. Now let's talk about one of the other big duties that school counselors do, and that's create student schedules. I'm gonna be honest, this is one of my least favorite parts of the job. It's a lot of administrative work, a lot of sitting in front of a computer, balancing classes, creating schedules. Although completing student schedules is important, 
it takes away from your ability to meet with students at times. Scheduling in my district starts in early February and runs from February to about the second or third week of August. So within that time frame, I'm doing lots of things like making sure that students have their complete schedule. I'm completing course requests, completing four-year plans for those eighth graders, making sure that students have a complete schedule, balancing classes to make sure that one class is not too big and the other one's too small, making sure that students get their elective choices or at least their alternatives. There's so many things involved with student schedules. And I always tell people that when you're creating schedules in middle school, it's like putting together a giant puzzle and you're in front of a computer for a large amount of time Sometimes it gets monotonous. You want to pull your hair out, but it's an important part of the job. I'm not disputing that. It's just not my favorite part. But I want to be realistic and let you know that you will be doing student schedules as a middle school counselor nine times out of 10. And it's not a whole lot of face-to-face -face interaction with students, which is my favorite part of the job. I like to actually get in there, meet with my students, and do hands-on activities with them, individual counseling sessions and things like that. And I know I didn't talk a whole lot about individual counseling sessions. Students will randomly come into my office about different issues and you have to be prepared. One of the biggest pieces of advice that I can give you if you take nothing else away from this video is make sure that you have resources readily available for when students come into your office. So some of the resources I would highly suggest that you get is a list of coping skills, some positive affirmations, some resources for combating negative thoughts, anger management resources, conflict resolution, like I mentioned earlier in this video, I statements, empathy lessons. These are things that I would say that if you can, go on Teachers Pay Teachers and find some free or inexpensive resources and build up your library so that when students come, you already have these things available. I keep mine in a colorful rolling cart that I bought from Michaels. And so when students come in and they are having a panic attack or they need to talk to me about they're angry, I pull out that coping skills worksheet and I go over those interventions with them. I highly suggest that you become familiar with resources, hands-on activities, and things that students can walk away with as far as their learning. When students come in your office, you're not just talking to them. Talking to them is okay. If you can have some type of resource that you can give to your students when they walk away from your office, that is going to be the thing that's gonna stick with them. And every time that I teach them a new skill or give them a new resource, I tell the student to pretend like they're the counselor and I'm the student and they should teach me how to do it. I always tell them to teach me in their own words. It doesn't have to be perfect. But if they can teach me the skill that I've taught them and use it in their own words, that lets me know that they've gained understanding of that skill and they know how to use it when they need it. All right, middle school counselors, if you're watching this video, share some words of encouragement for others who are watching. What are the best parts of your job as a middle school counselor? And if you're a brand new counselor, I have an amazing resource for you. I created an ebook, The New School Counselor's Guide, Five Essential Tips for Success. In this ebook, you will get amazing resources and templates such as a Meet the Counseling lesson that you can edit, a newsletter template that you can edit and share out with your families and students. You'll get a 30, 60, 90 day plan, which is a checklist that you can use to be set up for success and so many other things. If you wanna get your copy, go to counselingwithmrb.com. And be sure to join my Facebook group so you can network with other counselors, ask questions and get resources. And be sure to like this video if you haven't done so already. If you wanna support my channel in another way, you can buy me a coffee at the link below. After watching this video, check out this video on the screen. In this video, I share four amazing and inspirational stories of what it's like working as a middle school counselor. And I would love if you could watch that video.